Okay. Welcome everybody to the Community Kitchen Matzo Ball Soup Workshop. Hi everyone. Uh, feel free to put your cameras on and wave hello or drop a little hello in the in the chat or, um, or, or wave your Zoom hands. We all know how, how, how things work in this pandemic world. Um, just a quick little introduction about what the Community Kitchen is. We, um, we basically started this during pandemic as a way to bring people together around food, since that's something I think a lot of us love and, and have been missing in this difficult time. And what we do at the Community Kitchen is every month we have uh, a different event where we spotlight the cuisine of another culture and we share a recipe which is um, close to the hearts of, of some cooks of that background. And we do that to raise money for, um, for a cause that's close to that cook's heart. Um, we've done events for Indian food, Ethiopian food, Nigerian food, and a lot of Jewish food. And today, since it is since Passover is, is soon upon us, we are making matzo ball soup. We are uh, very blessed to have Rob Eshman uh, leading us in this. Rob is the food editor of The Forward, which is a wonderful Jewish publication. I recommend you all check out if you're not already a subscriber. Um, and before I hand it over to him, I'll just give a shout out that today's class is a fundraiser for Know Us Without You, which is an organization providing food security for undocumented immigrants who work in the hospitality industry here in Los Angeles. Um, I need to. Oops, sorry, I'm gonna mute that cook cam, cool. And um, we are just obviously very, very fortunate, um, I think, to, to benefit from the work of folks who work in the hospitality industry. And so if you are able to, um, we hope that you will consider donating. I'm just dropping uh, the, the link to their organization in the chat. Um, and uh, we'll try to make this a participatory, fun, co um, communal cooking class. Um, and so I'll just sort of be moderating throughout. If you're, if, let's see if anyone, I know it's, I know it's awkward timing for, folks in, in different time zones, but is anyone cooking along with us today? No. Uh, all right. I don't see anyone <laughs> raising their hand saying they're cooking. Um, well, that's, that's, oh, it looks like at least Lynn and Clifford in the Poconos are cooking. Well, that is great. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, at least we'll, we'll be able to enjoy Rob as a, uh, and, and sort of taste his food vicariously. Um, Judy says she has something on the stove, but not matzo balls. <laughs> All right. So without further ado, um, Rob, did we lose, you have your cook cam. Did we lose your other cam? Oh, uh -oh you're muted there. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. So my iPad cam went out and we're just restarting it. So in the meantime, you're going to lose my cook cam and I'll just start. Oh, let's see if that'll work now. We're going to restart it. And, but I'll start by talking about chicken soup and matzo balls for Passover. Um, how many of you have, are familiar with it, have made it? I can't really see the hands. Zach, you could see the hands. Yeah, it looks like, oh, well, my, my camera, my, my screen looks filled of, with hands, uh, at least <laughs> 10 hands of matzo ball makers. <laughs> 10 hands of matzo ball makers. So this is a very traditional dish that Jews all over the world, well, not all over the world, it's mostly an Ashkenazi Jewish dish make for Passover. Yeah, one second. I'm just gonna, can you hold up for a second? Um, let me just get you, get me so I could reset up here. Sure. Thanks for bearing with the technical difficulties, everyone, but nice. It was working perfectly. <laughs> Maybe um, you hit one of these things here. Just be careful. When you start. There has to be some good lesson in like the, I don't know, the progress of the not perfection. The Hold on one second. Oh, is that because there are two devices that you have two devices on? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Is yeah. It yeah. Like that? Thanks for calling that out, Xenia. Okay, you're welcome. 
Hi, Lynn. <laughs> okay. All right, here we are. So um, we know Passover is the holiday that celebrates the liberation of the Jews from Egypt many millennia ago, maybe in the mythological past. And um, the escape from Egypt, the Exodus, um, really is the founding story of the Jewish people. Genesis, the creation, is the founding story of humanity. But this is really the founding story of all the Jewish people. So um, traditionally, it was celebrated by roasting a goat or a lamb over a fire. It goes back to biblical times. Um, sometime after the beginning of the last month, you know, zero BCE, um, zero CE, um, it started to be celebrated after the destruction of the temple in, at tables with a liturgy, with singing. The liturgy is called the Haggadah. And then all sorts of special foods were developed to celebrate the holiday. And what I find as a food person, what I love about Passover is it's really a holiday where food is an integral part of the celebration. It's not like you sit, you celebrate and then you sit down and have a festive meal. The festive meal is the Passover celebration. So traditionally, the foods that we eat are symbolic of the meaning of the holiday. Um, chicken soup with matzo ball, not symbolic, but very traditional. Um, so why don't we get started? I wanted to show you, if you have any questions about Passover or some of the symbolism, we're going to be here together for a while so we can talk about it. Um, but one thing I should say is that every culture has a chicken soup, right? Wherever you go, there's chickens. Um, in fact, it was very traditional um, because there's a line in the Bible, may you be fruitful and multiply like the fowl upon the earth, F-O-W-L, that in the old days, if there was a wedding of a Jewish uh, groom and bride, they would bring them to the altar with a chicken and an egg in front of them to kind of symbolize um, fertility. Um, so chicken soup has always been part of a holiday celebration. Uh, how many of you, I'm sure most of you have made a chicken soup before, right? Right. Yeah. Okay. Um, could you see my cooking cam, Zach? Yep. I'm going to spotlight the cook cam. So everyone, you, you'll see there's a participant named Two Stars Cook Cam. Um, unfortunately, we, we don't have it on the landscape view, but hopefully you can at least see Rob's hands and a beautiful cooker chicken. So just to walk you through it, um, a chicken soup is really a simple, beautiful thing to make. Um, you could do it really easily by throwing all the ingredients in the pot, filling it with water, turning on the water, and then simmering it for a while. But I do one extra step that I'm going to show you today, which is I sear the chicken either in the broiler or in the pot itself to get a nice brown crust over it. And then that brownness um, really adds, I think, a depth of flavor to the soup. And it makes it also like a more golden color as well. It's really good. So the first thing you do, let me see if I can show you with this, is I'm just gonna heat up the pot and get this hot. Unfortunately, along with the other technical difficulties today, my stove light went out. So it's gonna be a little dark over there. Rough timing, but at least the stove still works, right? Stove works, right. Um, I'm just using a regular chicken. This is a kosher, uh, not regular, this is a kosher chicken. Um, kosher chickens are raised without hormones, without antibiotics. Um, they're killed in a kosher manner, um, which is the slicing of the arteries all at once, supposedly causes less pain. They've never asked a chicken if that's true. Um, and they tend to be very flavorful. Uh, they're salted also in brine. That's to remove the blood, but that extra step, as we all know, brining is really good for adding flavor and moistness to fit uh, to fowl. So it's um, it turns out to be a good thing for flavor too. So when the pan is hot, let's see, how should I do this? You're gonna come with me. Can you all see the pan? Yep. When it's hot, I'm just gonna add some neutral oil. Hmm. And get it pretty hot. I mean, you want it to get a good, you want it to get a really good sear. And um, 
while that's getting hot, why don't I show you the rest of the stuff that we're gonna do. I'm gonna take all the vegetables. One thing I love about this is it's just simple. A couple carrots. These are all gonna go into the pot. These are washed and you don't have to peel them. This is celery. Um, I'm one of those people, I really like to use the leaves of the celery and the, and the stock. I think the leaves have tons of flavor. One of the great underrated. And I also use in this recipe a parsnip. It's also a root vegetable and carrot family. And it just gives a slightly different kind of sweetness to it. So I throw in a parsnip and then bay leaf. This is right from the tree outside my house. So I have a lot of bay leaf. As I said in my recipe in the foreword, if any of you need bay leaf and you live in LA, DM me and I'll set you up with a few branches of it. And it lasts for a long, long time. It's best fresh though. I throw in a little dill at this point and some parsley. So we've got all of our vegetables ready. Oh, we got a key ingredient, the onion. I peel the onion just the first layer. You don't even have to peel the other inside layers if you don't want to. Um, they just add some depth also to the color and the flavor. And then again, this is a big onion. You can use two medium onions and you just roughly coarsely chop it. And one of you asked me, what about the garlic? Yeah, I do put garlic in. I don't have it out. Rob, can I, uh, can I ask a few questions to the audience? Because I think people are very impressed that you're growing bay leaves, uh, if you have advice for that. And also, you don't need to peel the parsnip. And what neutral oil are you using? I'm using um, just a regular neutral oil. And right now, can you all see? When you say, <laughs> neutral, oil, when you say neutral oil, like is that a canola, a grapeseed? Oh, so this is um, vegetable oil. It's actually canola oil. Lovely. All right. So we got some Costco canola oil, it looks like. Um, Costco canola oil. Um, and do you have to peel the parsnips? Um, I don't peel the parsnip. Um, we're going to use a parsnip in the finished soup. We're going to take all these vegetables and the chicken out. And then we're going to strain it so that it's get a very clear broth. And then before I serve it, I cook some parsnips and carrots in it for color and add some dill. So um, those parsnips are peeled. So these parsnips, they're, I mean, they're washed and clean. This one I peel. This, they're washed and clean, um, but I don't peel them, no. Okay, this doesn't take long. You're not cooking the chicken. You're not cooking the chicken. You just want to get a nice brown color to it. I hope you can all see that. Can you all yep. see that? And so, so far you just have vegetables making the broth. Haven't done anything with the chicken yet? Yeah, so vegetables, chicken, we're gonna add some salt and pepper and then we're done. So this adds another, this step, which is really a great step, not a crucial step, but a great one. Um, it adds, what, another five or so minutes to your cooking time. For most of chicken soup, the cooking takes place with, with very little effort, it's, you know, the cooking on the stove. The actual preparation, you can throw this together in just a few minutes. So, at this point, I really hope you can see this is the right color. You could get it a little browner if you want, a little more brown. But, Do you ever add celery to this? Susan's wondering. Yeah. So now, um, let me do this so you can see it. And I'll just get a, you can see it on the cooking jam. So now we have the chicken.
And we just add our vegetables into there. Yum. So you just threw all those vegetables right on top of that chicken. And some salt. And some pepper. And then water. When you do it this way, um, all the bits of chicken and the fat and the meat that's stuck to the bottom, um, that's going to come up from the water. You could also do the same thing by putting chicken pieces in a broiler. And I know in the recipe, I use chicken backs and necks and legs. And, and I do that because often I'll make chicken soup for a lot of people, hundreds of people, dozens at least. And it's just so much more economical to buy wings and backs and necks and parts that otherwise um, are not that expensive, but taste great because there's a lot of fat and there's a lot of um, sinew in those um, and skin. So I use those and I brown those in the broiler. You know, sometimes I'll brown them in a pan, but often in the broiler. So now I'm just gonna cover this by about an inch. Cover it by about an inch in water. You could always add more water later, but you don't want to, you know, and you could boil off water if you put too much water in. But um, I cover it by about one or two inches. Okay. Now this is going to go back on the stove. And, um, and, that's gonna, we're gonna bring that to a boil and then simmer it for an hour, hour and a half, could be two hours. You'll see it'll start to develop a really nice um, golden color and taste it. It might need more salt, it might need more pepper, um, and then you're done. So, well, I'll show you the next. I, hmm. Then you strain it and then you're done. Cool. Um, Couple questions about it. Um, when you so when you're done with it, if you freeze it, do you freeze it with the vegetables and the chicken? Like, what's the freezing? Okay. So this is going to cook for. It's going to come to a boil, and then I'm going to simmer it uncovered. Um, like I said, for about an hour, hour and a half. It could go longer, um, and then you take a. I don't have this stage of it but you set a strainer or a colander over a big pot and you strain it into the pot. Um, and then you let that cool down completely to room temperature outside your refrigerator, uncovered. You never, ever, ever cover something that's cooling. And then you cover it once it's at room temperature and put it in the refrigerator or freezer. So some people, Joan Nathan, the cookbook author, you should all have a cookbook, Jewish holiday cooking. Um, she freezes matzo balls in her chicken soup in the freezer. And that actually does make them a little spongy, a little lighter. Um, I don't do that, but, um, but yeah, once it's strained, you freeze it. And do you take any of the oil out after searing before cooking the soup? No, oil's good. They say fat's good for you now. I, I don't take anything out. Um, if something burned, like something really, like for some reason you burn something or there's even a burned feather down there, yeah, take out something that's burned. But otherwise, um, it just is going to smell good. And you just pour the water in there. You get all that fond, which they call it, that sticks to the bottom of the pot. You get that into the soup. And then the fat, when you leave it in the refrigerator overnight, and I really recommend, I mean, you can make the soup the same day. It's going to be great. But it's much better if you put it in the fridge overnight. And then in the morning, you'll see a layer of fat on top. And you gently scrape that fat off. And that you could use to make your matzo balls, as I'll show you in a second. Or you could just put it on toast, um, or you could, you know, put it on your potatoes. I would don't throw it away. That's great stuff. Mm. What about the bones? Do you strain those out? Yeah, everything comes out. You want to end up with a clear broth. So I'll show you. So this is soup that I made last night, and then I strained it. So you'll see these, a little bit of um, parsley or something floating there. Before I 
serve it and stuff. I'm going to strain it one more time to make it perfectly clear, but you don't, you don't have to, but I think it looks much better. And I took off a layer of fat. So there's still a little bit of fat in there. Um, so this is what it looks like strained. And that's what you're really going for. You're just going for this beautiful, this beautiful broth. It's kind of golden brown. Now this soup I made in an instant pot because I was cooking it last night. If you have an instant pot, I don't know how many of you do, but chicken soup in an instant pot is really easy and it's great. Um, it takes, you throw, you do everything I did. You sear the chicken on your stove, you put it in the instant pot with the vegetables, you cover it. 45 minutes, if you leave it in an hour, it is um, even better. And it's just, it's just unbelievable in an instant pot. It's really a time saver. And if you're really in a rush, you could throw a frozen chicken in an instant pot. So um, that's the chicken soup. Any other questions? Um, yeah, I just uh, real quick, uh, you mentioned an essential cookbook. What was that? So um, there's a few great Jewish cookbooks, but the real Julia Childs of Jewish cooking is a woman named Joan Nathan. And she wrote a book called Jewish Holiday Cooking. And it has fantastic Passover recipes. It is really where I learned a lot of great Jewish recipes other than from my mother. Um, and, and you'll see that it's, um, you know, it's, it's time tested. People have been using it for many, many years now, Jewish holiday cooking. Um, and she's got, Joan has 12 cookbooks and they're all great, but um, that really is like a classic that you just, you know, need to keep it on your bookshelf. Like Marcella Hazan's classic Italian cooking. So your child, you just need a copy of Julia, of um, Joan Nathan's book. So the chicken soup recipes, the matzo ball recipes, a lot of recipes I have, I've developed, you know, starting from hers. Those other great Jewish cookbooks, that's the one you have to have. Awesome. Um, one- oh, You ready yeah. for matzo balls? I think we're ready for matzo balls. Last questions, I think we're just about the, uh, the vegetables, which is just about um, the need to peel parsnips and carrots. Yes, no. Wash them really well. If they look filthy, like if you picked them from your garden, um, then yeah, wash them really well. You might even want to peel them. But if, you know, they, these came from Ralph's and they're really well washed and scrubbed and I scrubbed them more. So I just don't. I think there's a lot of flavor and there's a lot of nutrition. I just want to show you as long as we have a little time. This is my bay leaf tree right outside the door. Ooh. And um, I mean, this is... What are bay leaves like a dollar for a bundle of little bay leaves at the farmer's market? So that tree's what worth three million dollars. Um, <laughs> fresh bay leaves, fresh bay leaves have a far superior flavor to um, to the dry bay leaves. And um, I know they say no, you need Turkish bay leaves. You don't. That's just a myth put out there by big bay leaf. Um, buy yourself a bay leaf tree. That tree that you saw, it's about 40 feet tall. It started like this big. Um, they grow like crazy in California, if you look in California. So um, yeah, all the herbs and vegetables, I mean, the celery, the parsley, the bay leaves, the lemon, whatever I use, it's from the garden. So it really does improve the flavor. Uh, Let's do matzo balls. Let's do it, yeah. Let's do um, it. We have a, you've recruited a crew here to take down big bay leaf, especially if you're <laughs> across the country. So if any of you are interested, if you live in LA, DM me on Instagram and I'll set it out in front of the house and you can come by and pick up some bay leaf. And if you want a branch of it to plant, it also grows from, grows from that. So not always successfully. I've, I've had mixed luck with it, but it, they say it does grow from that. Um, and it'll, you know, it's just always around. It's great. You never run out of bay leaf. Um, so matzo balls are like, you know, you think Jewish, you think bagels, lox, matzo ball. It's got to be in the top 10 thing people think, you know, Jerry Seinfeld, matzo balls. They are really a dumpling. So dumplings are cross-cultural, right? Every culture has a dumpling, something doughy that's poached in liquid. Um, the thing about Passover, can you see me okay? Yep, we see Okay, you. so the thing about Passover is you celebrate, you mark the exodus of the children of Israel from Egypt. They were in a rush. They didn't have time. They had to get out of there really fast. Um, they were slaves and they had to run away. 
So you're commanded to eat matzah, which is unleavened bread. And beyond that, you're not allowed to have any kind of leavening for the eight days of Passover. So matzah is made with flour and water. And um, you'll say, well, if you can't have any kind of leavening or anything that can be leavened, so you can't have flour, you can't have barley, you can't have, if you're Ashkenazi, you can't have rice. Anything that potentially can be leavened, you can't have. But you can have matzah because it's cooked in a way under rabbinical supervision in 18 minutes. It doesn't have time to be leavened, even by the wild yeast in the air. No such thing as sourdough matzah. Um, so probably there is by now. There's probably a thousand recipes for sourdough matzah online. Um, so um, matzah balls are the Passover equivalent, basically, of a, of a dumpling. Instead of using flour, like you would if you were going to make um, chicken, dump, chicken and dumplings, you're using matzah meal. It usually comes like this in a can or a box. And um, it's really just ground up matzah. It's finely ground matzah. And it's basically what passes for flour for the eight days of Passover for the Jews who observe it. So to make matzah meal, we're just gonna make a real, I mean, matzah, matzah balls, which are called knedlach in Yiddish. By the way, the winner of the 2013 International American Spelling Bee was an Indian American boy. I think he was 11 years old. And the winning word that he spelled that nobody else could was Knedlach. <laughs> that was what a great country we live in. Let's see. We're going to do um, a cup of, I think it was a little short of a cup, a cup of matzah meal. Um, and salt, you have the recipe there. So, and then let me get the right proportions because I don't have it memorized. Four eggs. All right, can you use cake flour instead of matzo meal, Lynn asks? No, if you wanna make matzo, oh, could you use matzo cake flour? Yeah, I guess matzo cake flour is the question. If you, you can, you know, it, they're not as light when you use matzo cake flour. I've tried it, but I only tried it once, so I can't speak with authority. Maybe there's a way, but when I found it, there are two. Matzo cake flour is the same as matzo flour, but it's ground more fine. And it somehow just doesn't, um, I don't know. It doesn't, it doesn't create as light, a light as matzo ball. There's two schools of thought. There's people that like their matzo balls really heavy, like uh, bowling balls, cannonballs. And there's people that like their matzo balls super light, like, you know, angel's wings or something. Um, mine are more on the light side, but they, de they do have some kind of density to them. They say that Prime Minister Golda Meir, she was famous for matzo balls that like could sink a ship. Um, but uh, you'll find most of the ones you get are on the lighter side. And there's a few techniques to make them that way. You know, you don't want people... You're judged by your matzo ball, put it that way. It begins the Seder meal, the Passover meal. It's the first course is usually chicken soup and matzo ball. And you know, the first thing people bite into after sitting through a service at a table that could be two hours long are these matzo balls. You want them to be great. People are hungry. You want them to be wonderful. So I'm gonna teach you a couple tricks for that. Um, four eggs, cup of matzo meal, um, a teaspoon of salt, and then I use seltzer for the liquid. Um, it's a quarter cup. I don't know that it makes a huge difference, but I've always used seltzer or I use chicken stock, either one. You could also use water. Last night I used water, that's fine too. Um, vegetable oil, like I said, for the, instead of vegetable oil, you could use chicken fat from your chicken soup that you made the night before, but I've already used it up, so I don't have any of that. And then some pepper. Yum, any, any specific kind of salt, someone asks? Uh, kosher salt, I guess, the kosher matzo balls. I mean, this is like children's cooking. Then you mix up the mush. And if it looks a little loose and you think, oh my God, how am I gonna ever form this into a ball? Um, this matzah is like, it's thirsty. And um, you're gonna set this in your refrigerator for an hour 
and you can set it up overnight. You can set it up over two nights. You can make this, you know, well in advance. And as it sits, it's going to absorb. The matzah is going to absorb the egg and the water, and um, it's going to. It, it will not be. It won't be. Uh, it, it'll be gelled enough to make into balls. So we cover this with plastic wrap, and then we're going to put it in the refrigerator. Can you get a uh, schmaltz at a store? So last night, oh, you know what I forgot to do, you guys? Um, I usually put in a quarter cup of chopped herbs, dill, parsley, something like that, into the mix and mix it in. That's why this is green and that one wasn't. So I forgot the chopped dill. So um, so you in the once you mix like it in, now, Rob, is that right? this was in the fridge overnight. Okay. So you could see it was really loose yesterday, and now you could see it's very chopped, firm. Are the chopped herbs in the in the soup or in the matzo balls? Oh, in the you're matzo. gonna have chopped herbs in both, but these are in the matzo ball, which I think, you know, matzo balls by themselves they take on a little bit of the flavor of the soup, but otherwise they're just kind of like matzo in a different form. You find it in Passover, you eat matzo in a lot of different forms. Um, so I find it gives it a little bit more flavor and spring flavor to put some herbs in it, but you certainly don't have to. I wouldn't call it super traditional. Most matzo balls you get in a delicatessen are just gonna be the ball. Um, so I wanna show you this. Our soup is now boiling. And I'm gonna turn it down to a nice simmer. Doesn't that look beautiful? And it's going to simmer. And if you see there's some brown scum that's come up, that's from the chicken. It's probably blood and different parts of the bone. So um, different things coming from the bone. So you skim that off as you go. If you see it, you skim it off. Um, doesn't really improve the flavor. Um, and then we're going to keep it simmering like that for an hour, hour and a half. And then it'll be done. Then we're going to strain it and finish it. So with the matzo ball, is it better to, for those uh, matzo balls? Is it better to keep them in the fridge overnight like you did, or or is it better to just do one hour? What do you recommend? I think it's better overnight. Um, I mean, when you're cooking Passover, you're cooking for a lot of people generally. It's a lot. It's many courses. It's actually based on the Greek banquets. And there were many course banquets because the Passover Seder was really developed at the time that the Greeks were, um, were the, you know, the main culture. And the Jews modeled the Passover Seder after these symposiums that the Greeks would do. And they would start with um, dipping greens. So we dip greens, but we give it a different symbolic meaning. meaning. Um, so there's just a lot of courses. And so the more you could do ahead of time, the better. I make the matzo balls the night before. Um, Joe Nathan makes them, and I think my mom too, makes them several days before and freezes them. So if you're having 100 or 50 people for Passover, that certainly makes sense. Um, matzo balls are not a cuisine. They're not, they're pretty indestructible. So you could, they're, they're the flexible part of your meal. I make them the night before. So um, you take some water and you, Well, what I should have been doing is having some water boiling. So I'm just gonna demonstrate how you do this, but you boil water and then you make these matzo balls. It really helps to have wet hands. So I wet my hands and then you just take about a walnut size and like a walnut size and you plop them in boiling water. Let's, let's assume this water is boiling. Walnut size, roll it. Now, one trick I found is people roll and roll and roll and roll and they compact it and they compact it. And then you get, it gets tougher in the middle. So I just roll them as fast as I can and put them in the water. I don't spend a lot of time rolling them. And if they're not absolutely perfect, you know, they could have a little rough edges, that's okay. So these go in boiling water. You turn the water down to a simmer, cover it. You have to keep it covered and then you simmer them for 40 minutes. So, 
at the end. Any questions? Any Matsubal questions? Let's see, any questions from folks? Uh, oh, one question we did have was uh, what herbs did you use to add to the matzo balls? What herb? What herb? Yeah. Um, I use fresh dill and sometimes a mixture of dill and parsley. But, um, and like I said, I just went out and picked it, washed it, um, chopped it. It's um, dill is really like one of the first that it really tastes like spring dill and it's beautiful right now. Um, so it's a very traditional herb to put into matzo ball soup. Um, and into the matzo balls. So I just use a little, you know, if you have a tablespoon, put a tablespoon in, you could do more or less. Um, people flavor it with turmeric. Um, they flavor it with all different things, some onion, some garlic, but I keep them very straight, except for the dill. Any other questions? Yes, how much seltzer water? So it's um, a quarter cup of seltzer and a quarter cup of, a quarter cup of seltzer and a quarter cup of um, oil or chicken fat. And you could use seltzer, you could use water, you could use chicken soup stock, um, whatever you got. And this is also a recipe that you could half or you could multiply exponentially. And you know, you have 200, 300 people for your Seder, you could just keep going. It's a really easy recipe to, to expand on or cut down. Thank you. Sure. Um, so, let me show you. So, when you lift the lid off your matzo balls, these are already in soup, but after 40 minutes, you turn the water off and you're going to have these beautiful, can you all see this? These are pretty perfect, if I do say so myself. Um, you strain the soup. You put the matzo balls in the soup and you leave them there. If you're refrigerating the soup, refrigerate the matzo balls in the soup. If you're freezing the soup, freeze the matzo balls in the soup. Um, and then when it's ready to serve, when you're ready to serve, you want to reheat the soup. And then what I do is I peel carrots and I peel parsnips and I just cut little coins, you know, like that big, into this, like very thin, into the soup. And then those are reheating. As the soup reheats, those will cook. And then just before serving, um, just before serving, I take some of this dill and I chop it. And then you're ready to serve. You've got your soup that's strained. I like the mixture of the carrots, um, the carrots and the parsnips. I just think it gives it interesting. And then the soup that's strained, and then this beautiful. Do you um uh do you cover the soup when it's boiling? Uh, Susan asks, won't the water boil out too fast? Uh, no, because you're not boiling the soup now. You're, um, you mean right now as we're cooking it? Yeah, I think that's right. No, I, I, I don't cover it. Sometimes I'll, um, you know, you're simmering it. Let me go back and show you what you want. You don't want to boil. You want like a nice simmer. Mm. And sometimes this is even, this, this could even be a little lower. Like that. And yeah, sometimes if it looks like the water's boiling out, you could cover it a little bit. I don't cover it too much all the way because then um, you can inadvertently have it boil over. And I also, um, when you're reheating the soup or when you're putting the uh, matzo balls in and the carrots and the parsnips, you don't want to boil the soup. You just want to get it to that point where it's kind of shimmering and about to boil, but you don't want to boil it because then it gets cloudy. Um, so, okay, you said there. You said there's a secret for uh, light, fluffy matzo balls? So the two secrets I've found are um, don't overmix it. And then when you're forming them, as I said, form them very quickly. Like don't, don't worry about getting them perfectly round and compacting and compacting them. Form them very quickly. 
and then let them rest in the soup. Let them absorb all the liquid they can before you serve them. And that'll light, actually lighten them up a little bit. Um, like I said, some people recommend freezing them in the soup, but there's not always time to do that. So you don't have to do that. Those things falls light. Um, also, the last thing is go if when you're mixing the matzo balls with the oil and the water and the eggs, don't be afraid to make it a little looser than you think it should be, because the more water you bring into it, the lighter they're going to be. I have a question. Sure. Um, what do you do with all that chicken? Oh, that's a really good question. So, it's a tough one. I mean, most people throw it away because after that chicken's been there for two hours, you boiled it for two hours. There shouldn't be any flavor left in the chicken, all the flavors and not much nutrients, all the flavors in the soup. So I hate throwing stuff away, but I've tasted chicken and vegetables that have been, um, that I've made soup from and they have no flavor. They just, it's like nothing. So you can't really, you can eat it, but you can't really eat it. I mean, there's not much to eat. I don't even know how many nutrients. So I used to throw it away, which I hate doing, but I haven't figured out what else to do with it. Anybody have ideas? Maybe, maybe. Chicken salad. It just, it tastes, it doesn't taste good. That's the problem. It just tastes like stringy, like it just it tastes, good. that's the problem. Um, so my, I don't know. My mom, my mom used to make chicken soup and she would take the chicken out and then put it back in the soup. You know, mm -hmm. the strands of chicken in the soup. Right. I mean, what I do when I want that is I throw out that first chicken and then when I'm reheating the soup, I reheat fresh chicken in it and I actually poach the chicken in the soup. Like this is not a poached chicken. This is chicken that's like completely should be deprived. I mean, it, cause it like the flavor is sucked out of this chicken. You mean you so put a poached chicken, work. you take a, a raw chicken and put it in the soup? No, I'll take like um, either a chicken breast or another piece of the chicken and I'll put it in the soup and cook that and then I'll shred mm -hmm. that into the soup, yeah. And then it's really flavorful to get that fresh chicken flavor. If I'm making a poached chicken, then I'll poach a chicken in a soup for what, 30 minutes, 40 minutes, and then it's great. But this is cooking for an hour or two. Maybe I'll give it to my dog. Yeah, I was yeah. just, just going to say it's your dog. Yeah, it's, it's good protein, you know? Yeah. Um, should we, uh, I'm going to call it, Zach, were there other questions? Um, let's see, folks, other, other questions? I think, th I know there's been a bunch in the chat. I want to make sure I've gotten to all of them. If not, feel free to just uh, raise your hand. I can call on you and bring you I want to say thank you. I have to run. Thank you so I'm much. Gonna get my, I'm going to get my taster, and our taster is, is my wife, who's also a rabbi, and she's going to taste it and maybe give us all a little Passover, a couple words about Passover. Maybe a blessing. One second. That would be nice. Where are you, buddy? Zach, I have to go. Okay, thanks, Deborah. Bye, thank you. Hurry. Yeah, stick around if you can. Uh, Rob's wife, Rabbi Naomi Levy, is incredible. Hopefully, she'll be able to give us a little Passover blessing. Um, while we're waiting for that, does anyone have any? Um, maybe what's uh, what's your most your your happiest Passover memory, or your funniest Passover memory? If anyone wants to share one. Anyone have any Passover uh, food disasters, first attempts at making matzo balls that came out so well? I wrote an entire article once about my Passover food disaster. I was catering, I was trying to impress Naomi. So I offered to cater the second night Seder for her synagogue at the time. And there were 200 people that I was making chicken food for. And I didn't quite, I didn't know at the time, even though I'd been catering for a while, I hadn't exactly done that. And um, I made 200 gallons of, I made all these gallons of chicken soup and I covered it and put it in the fridge and it spoiled. So everybody was coming for Passover and then we had no chicken soup. So I ran to the market, I got kosher powdered chicken soup and I put it in hot water and people loved it. Um, you ready to taste? I'm ready to taste on the official soup taster. Hi everybody. I'm wishing all of you a very, very happy and healthy Passover. But let's see if it's really good or not. Rob, you look too tall or I look too short. Uh, I'll scouch, scrouch. 
Oh my God. It's the nectar of the gods. This is really good. Wait, let me try the matzo ball. Oh my God. It's delicious. Mm. It's unbelievable. Mm. Oh my God. It's really, really good. good. Mm. So I'm wishing all of you I know you can't eat Rob's food and I can, but I'm wishing all of you a wonderful Pesach, wonderful Seders, and let this year be the beginning of, I just read that, that um, in, in California, they're opening up the vaccine very soon to everybody over 16 oh, wow. years old. So I'm just wishing all of you a Chag Sameach and a Pesach that's filled with hope, with health, with healing, and with that spirit of saying this pandemic soon will be behind us. Amen. Amen. God willing, amen. Thank you everybody. Zach, thanks a lot for doing this. You can always find me at foodieism at forward.com. Thanks all. Thank, Thank you. you everybody. Thank right. you. Thank you, Rob. Thank you, Thank you, Thank you Zach. Hak Sameah. Hak Sameah. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. You got to make this you. scoop. <laughs> got to go start now. Sorry about the technical difficulties, Zach. No, it's all good. Hey, mom, can you, can you show us your soup, mom, that you're eating? I'm spotlighting you for everybody. Is it all gone? <laughs> Not much left. I can show you the pot. But, but Rob, I know we overcooked the chicken and all. It still tasted really good. We added that to the soup. The chicken and the vegetable. Yeah, it was fine. It was totally I, fine. I just don't like the taste of it, but a lot of people do. I think uh, my wife's family, they added back to the pot too. Yeah, it was fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we added a bunch of dill and some parsley and actually a little zatar. We had that in the house. Oh, wow. And, nice. um, I've never seen zatar like that. Zatar. Yeah, so we had that. And uh, it was great. It was great. So thank you. Thank you. It was really fun. Cool. Thanks so much, Rob. Appreciate you doing this. Um, okay. See everybody. Happy, See you, Zach. Happy Bye. Passover. Bye. Bye. Bye.